Okay, so we're recording. Um, here we go. Thank you so much for for joining me tonight. I'm really honored that you're, that you're here. Um, uh, it's fun to see some new people and some familiar faces. Um, really honored. Uh, it's a relatively small group, so as long as it stays small, please uh, interrupt. Uh, um, just un unmute yourself if you have a question. If something's not clear, you can also use the chat if something is unclear or, or if you want to make a question or comment, and I will try to monitor it. Uh, I want to start with a few caveats uh, before we dive in. Uh, the first caveat is that um, I I'm not a... Um, a political scientist. I'm not a philosopher. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm not operating with a um, with like a rich grounding in theory, which I hope will not be uh, disappointing. I, I think we are going to do is look at some Torah sources and, and talk about some ideas, uh, and, and then hope in that way we'll we'll get some uh, we'll get some understanding and 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 uh, you know talk about ideas in a, in a fruitful way. Um, but um, uh, you're not going to get like a grand theory, which I you know which. Maybe if I teach this again, you know, I'll 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 uh, be able to uh, um, develop some of that. But I have not done that reading. I, I don't have that expertise. But I think we'll look at some Torah together, and we'll explore some ideas together. And I and I hope I'll I'll gain some some understanding, and hopefully you will as well. A second caveat I wanted to just sort of say is that um, one of the challenges that I found in you know synagogue based adult education is that people have sometimes a difficulty in separating like themselves from the ideas that we are. Um, going to encounter. So you may encounter idea, you will probably encounter ideas with which you disagree, uh, perhaps even strongly. And I just want to urge you to kind of, um, you know, if you have an urge to like argue or to just like try to like take those feelings and like put them someplace and uh, and spend some time just like grappling with the ideas as they are, okay? And try to just sort of appreciate them, you know, for what they are, you know, like tonight we're gonna look at Rav Moshe Feinstein's position on, on the halakha question. Try to like grapple with his words, his perspective and like put a, so this bracket for the for the moment, whether or not you agree or not, and try to try to kind of put that aside. Sometimes when we uh, are so focused on whether we agree or not, and and our own positions, where we sort of miss out on the chance to encounter a, a different perspective, which has a lot of value. And so I hope over three weeks. So this week we're going to look at Rav Moshe Feinstein. I, we're going to look at a halachic piece, a short a tshuva of his about the propriety of flags uh, in synagogue sanctuaries. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know me in real life, uh, we do have flags in our shul. Um, um, so he discusses that in this shuva, and it's, I think, an interesting, maybe, hopefully you'll, you'll agree with me, it's an interesting facet with which to address this question of the interaction of religion and nationalism. Uh, next week, we're going to look at uh, the position of Yeshua Leibovitz, uh, the great uh, 20th century uh, Israeli philosopher and, um, and chemist, um, and uh, we're going to see, uh, particularly his um, very strident and strong position on the relationship of religion and national identity, religion and nationalism, and we're going to interrogate it. This is a position that has been extremely influential in my life to, to me, uh, and uh, but I, I've uh, recently uh, rethunk, uh, rethought uh, some some of his uh, his ideas, and we're going to sort of explore explore that together. Uh, Michael Manikin uh, published a book a year or two ago in which he has a whole chapter devoted to really. Uh, confronting a Leibovitz. And I think that that's what I want to work through with you and, and share that with you and explore that with you. And the third week, we're going to look at Ramosha Vigdra Amiel. Uh, some of us in the shul have studied his uh, dreshot uh, uh, before, I think over the past year. Uh, he was uh, chief rabbi of uh, Tel Aviv in the early 20th century, an incredibly talented darshan and um, um, a speaker and, and scholar, and uh, had a really, really um, unique and special um, understanding of, of nationalism and its um, its value and its and its danger, and I think uh, that that's probably going to yeah. So that that might be if there's some sort of synthesis, some sort of uh, uh, takeaway, we might might more likely, most likely for most of us, we'll get it in that third third week. Okay, well let's um, let let's dive in. I'm going to in the chat. I'm going to share the uh, the link for the Safari source sheet, so you can follow along. Um, so you can follow along uh, on your own, and um, you, you know look at it that way. And I'm also going to share my screen. So. Um, Okay, there's the link and I'll share my screen now. Let me just also, before I share my screen, let me close out of WhatsApp because people are texting me here. Okay, um, and I don't want to inter be interrupted. I don't want you to read what they say. Um, that's uh, okay, right? That, that's like the biggest, I don't know, biggest fear of sharing screens is that something embarrassing will pop up on my, uh, okay. Um, here we go. Okay, great. All right, here we are. Um, this is my the translation is is, a, is my own 
quick and dirty translation. So, you know, if it's if you've noticed a mistake, it's it, it is a mistake. Okay. Um, so what we'll read through in Hebrew and I'll, I'll, I'll that's how we'll, we'll do it that way. Okay. So this is so Igor Moshe, of course, these are the the Shailam Shuvot, the response of Moshe Feinstein, that's how one of the you know, among the greatest uh, post coming greatest Halakha scholars ever to set foot in America. He started his career in uh in 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 Russia and in Soviet Russia and, and came to the United States uh uh, I believe in the late twenties, um, mid twenties. I, I forget the exact date, but his he really uh, grew to prominence in the nineteen fifties um, as the predominant Orthodox postdoc in the United States. And uh, there are eight volumes of Igor Moshe that uh, seven volumes that he published, and eighth volume that was published uh, after his death. Uh, this is from uh, early volume. Okay, uh, so Orachim Aleph and Vav Beinyan Beit Knesset Shahu Amadu Sham Hadigalim. Okay, so what the, the framing of the question is also interesting. Okay, so there's a, a synagogue, right, where the flag of the United States and the flag of Israel are have been put up in the sanctuary. And because of that, there are a few individuals who no longer want to dive in there. Is this, is this, is this a thing? Okay. Um, um, that they that this is appropriate. This shul doesn't seem so firm to them. They want to form a breakaway minion because there are flags in the sanctuary of this shul. Because that, that's the framing of the question. It's not should we put a flag in the shul. The, the framing of the question is um, uh, are the flag the American Israeli flag? So there's a reason to to pray elsewhere. Okay, that frame is important. Okay, the date of this is um, the 19th of Tammuz. Tavshin Yud Zayin is 1957. Okay, so it's the Golden, you know, mid-century, you know, I, I mean, like, if you know our shul, like our shul was built, okay, in the years that, within a year or two of, of this chuva, okay, so that, that probably those flags are from 1957 that we have, okay, so it was, um, uh, that, that was just, you know, a certain style of Balabatish orthodoxy in, um, in, in mid-20th uh, century, 1957 is the Eisenhower presidency, it's a time where, um, you know, I think it was Eisenhower himself, who's, I don't care if you're a, uh, you know, what kind of church you go to, as long as you're, you know, like the Jewish church, the Catholic church, the Protestant, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it's a sign, it's part of your American identity to be, have some religious affiliation uh, as part of a sort of a Cold War American identity, which was very much uh, linked to uh, to religion. And and so uh, the fact that there would be flags in houses of worship is very much a piece of, uh, um, you know, of a piece of this 1957, you know, America um, sort of th that setting. Um, so here's here's what he says. So and it's from Yedidia the Rav uh, Yisachar Beresh Halprin, who was the the Rebbe of Mereshu Baich. So the little Hasidic Rebbe who ends up at a shul here. Um, I, I looked him up on on Genie. He's like a I think he's like a sixth cousin, third three times removed of mine. Okay, which is uh, almost nothing, but uh, it's kind of cool to find that out. Okay. Um, through the branch of my family, my my great grandfather's mother was a descendant of Eli, of Elimelech of the Zinsk. So that's how I get some of these uh, uh, Polish uh, um, Hasidic uh, sixth cousins. Okay, Hine, bit of our Beit Knesset, Shinivna Kedin Kedusha Beit Knesset. The synagogue is built Kedin Kedusha. Okay, it was built appropriately with all of what should be for a shul. Ukvahid Palubo, and they've already dived in there, so it's used as a shul, Bigzu uh, Chateau in its full sanctity. Even if the shul is used for something really, really problematic, okay? Um, okay, I don't know, like, you know, like in the 50s, there were shuls, they had mixed dancing, okay? God forbid you can imagine such a thing. Uh, in the, hey, um, but he's actually even worse, okay? Uh, almost as okay? Whoa, okay, the shamish was having an illicit sexual affair in the synagogue, okay? You can imagine, I... I you have a story like that in recent years, okay? But uh, so can you imagine the scandal, right? That's a lot of the kiddish talk, okay? Um, nonetheless, we come, come, lo nitchalalak question here. So when he says this, um, is this in like the sanctuary itself or in the building? Do we know? Does like what would it be referring to? It sounds like it's in the in the sanctuary itself. Yeah. Okay. okay? That's what I was thinking. Pretty, so yeah, yeah, you know, it's pretty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No idea. You know, don't try this at home, right? I don't don't recommend this. Find you know. Yeah. Uh, um, okay, I think that it must be despite this, despite this like terrible um act of desecration, this forbidden act, this unholy act, this you know, right? There's things that are you know inappropriate for sure, but are fine in other places. There are things that are inappropriate and wrong no matter where you do them. This is one of those things. Um, and it was done in the shul. Nonetheless, the shul remains a shul. 
Even in the moment of the sin itself, the sin was taking place in a shul. It made it worse, but it was happening in a shul. It was still a shul. I think he's saying, if this is the sentence that I'm not quite sure if I'm explaining right. I think he's saying, if it weren't that case, then it wouldn't be the the whole the whole situation discussed with again Abraham is this illicit sexual act in the shul and whether or not the shul remains holy. It, it must be that it were it were it, were it no longer shul, there'd be no question. <laughs> Okay, if if you if an act of desecration would remove the synagogue from its status as a shul, then you would have no question because right once the deed was done, it would no longer be a shul. I think that's what he's saying. So once a shul has a shul has that status, you can't remove it from its sanctity, even if you do things there that are not so appropriate. You have. You know, you auction off all you. I don't know. You, you, you know, you you have a bingo night. You you have a you know a ball dance. You have you have a, you know the shamish. You know goes there for his affair with who? Right. It, it's still a shul. Okay. They it's built as a shul. It's davened in as a shul. It has a status as a shul. The imken af im neima de haamadat degalim berakneset hu b'davar isur lo nirchalala hagadusha bekach va'adif lepelal sham ilasot minyan v'mekom chol. So even if you want to say, even if we'll posit that erecting flags in a synagogue is a forbidden action, it still wouldn't detract from the sanctity of the synagogue, and it's better to dive in there than to dive in any other place. Right? It still has that special sanctity of being a shul. It's a better place to dive in than any like neutral place you also could dive in, despite you know this prohibited thing they're doing. Okay, so that, that's step one. Okay, so that that's sort of. Uh, you know, in terms of responding to the question, as you're saying, do we want to make our we want to make our own minion? Um, you know, so I, it, it's sort of uh, responding that. Oh, Carly, what about synagogue becomes? Yes. Yeah. So there is a mechanism for like actually like de-sanctifying a shul altogether. You can say it's all of a shul. You can sell it. You can be a church. You can be a bank. You can make it into apartments. You know, um, that that is something that happens. That is something that can happen. Um, that that is um, like separate here. It remains as a shul. The intent is to keep it as a shul. It's just used. You know, something forbidden is happening there. Uh, good question, Carla. Thank you for asking. Yeah, there, there is a mechanism for for that. <clears throat> but now he says, <laughs> It doesn't clear to me, like, what is the prohibition in putting up flags? Okay, so without reading further, what would you suggest? What might what would be the prohibition of putting flags in shul? You can chat or unmute yourself. Well, if, I mean, if you read already, then okay. But like, what, what, what's, I don't know. If somebody were against it, what would they, why would they be against it? Avoda Zara. Avoda, who said that? Sorry, who said that? Me, Carly. Carly, great. So say more, Avoda Zara, because why? Because it's like right in the front of the shul. And because you're right in front of the shul and you're going to be bowing and davening in that direction. So it could be misconstrued that you're facing towards the flags as opposed to Hashem. Yeah. And why? And why? Just let's, let's, you're right. And can you just like tease it out a little bit? Why? Why? Would you be more likely, or might someone have that construct, you know, construe that, have that construal regarding the flags, as opposed to anything else? Like, there's also a chair. We have a chair next to our own kodesh. Because I feel like there are some, even just like laws that you can't burn an American flag, mm -hmm. or there are certain, and you can't like, I don't know, throw it away. You have to fold it up nicely. Yeah, we have a flag code, right? So, so we treat the flag kind of with reverence, and so unlike. The chair that we have next to the Arn Kodesh, the flag that's next to the Arn Kodesh is an object of like symbolic meaning that we treat with reverence. And now we face it when we, during worship uh, and bow in its direction, um, that does kind of look like it's an object of worship in a way that like anything else wouldn't. Yes, Joel. Yeah, so I don't know if it's like literally a vote czar, right? So leaving aside, okay, you're bowing to it. It's, it's taking a shul. Right, which is you're taking the shul, what the purpose of the shul is, it's to dove in, it's to learn, it's to do shul kind of things. And um, you have the Aaron Kodesh there and you're putting up in a pride of place, this other thing. Um, and you might think that that's like, uh, you know, put, pushing aside Torah and, and all the stuff you want to do in the shul. Yeah, it's divided um, allegiance, right? Divided allegiance. You come to shul, yeah. instead of just focusing on worshiping God, I'm also showing all these other pieces of my identity that yeah. I, you know, I love my country, I love Israel. And these are other pieces of my identity that I'm kind of foregrounding 
when I really should be thinking only about Torah and Mitzvot and God and things like that. Yeah, so I think like when I've learned, I don't know if there's like the actual halacha on this, but like there's certain things, like if it's a yuntif, you shouldn't like, there's a question about like celebrating other things or if it's, uh, you know, we have an order, um, like when you say bracha, you have a certain order, like certain things do like take precedence. There's this idea, you know, if you have the different maftiers, you know, Shabbat, yeah. uh, you know, Hanukkah, Rosh, right? There's a certain order of things. And if you, you could throw it out of order, right? By having this new thing. Right. Okay. Here, here's another, maybe here's an example that, that comes to mind. There's, you know, there's a certain type of, um, there's a halakha that um, you're not supposed to hug anyone in shul. Um, Cause, uh, Shul is a place for expressing our love of God, and we shouldn't express our love for human beings in Shul, in like physical ways. You don't, you don't, you're not supposed to embrace anyone in a Shul. Uh, yeah, they're making make a counter argument. I don't know if it's, like, but that that's black, black, that is in the Shulchan Aruch, I believe that that's, uh, you know, so that's right, because you're, the, you come here, like, I'm, this, is, this is the building, this is the time and the place where I'm going to express my love for God and my devotion to God, and like, even though it's wonderful to have and important to have uh, loving relationships with other human beings, like, that's not what this building is for. At least not. That's not what I'm here for right now. Um, at, least, at least that would be the argument. Okay. So, so the flag is like it's a divided allegiance. Okay. Any other arguments or other possibilities before we see his response? Okay. Let's go on. Okay. So, there's yes, Okay, there's no prohibition bringing bringing like secular, neutral objects to a shul. Not everything in a shul has to have a sacred function. Um, some, uh, you, you can bring something into shul that has a neutral function, has no purpose whatsoever, can be brought into a shul. There's no prohibition in that. And that's true if the synagogue is built not on Tanai, without preconditions, you know, and certainly even the more so a synagogue like ours, right? The Gemara tells us, Grand Megillah says that synagogues in the diaspora are not meant to be permanent. They're built out tonight that on the condition that one day we'll dismantle them or sell them or move or, you know, or we can use them for multi-purpose and we, you know, and and, uh, and not just, you know, use them for, for prayer. And so we, we, we that's that's a condition on, on their on their construction. That's sort of implicit, I guess, according to the Gemara and Megillah, okay? But, uh, but even that, even where that, you still, there's nowhere on earth uh, under no situation is prohibited to bring an object into a shul that has no shul purpose. Fiyaf she'elu. Shasuzel ledegel v'siman even though the people who turned this flag into the symbol of Medina Israel were Rishayim, they were wicked people. Why are they wicked people? Because they, you know, were Michal Shabbos and they ate lobsters and they um, and they rebelled against Judaism by being Zionists and building the state of Israel, right? Within Rav Moshe Feinstein's perspective, okay? They didn't think the flag was holy. Okay, there's no possibility of saying that there's any, like, what's any possible um, intimation of a vodazara of idolatry, because they didn't intend the flag to be holy. Um, so Ramosh is making a distinction between valuing something and endowing it with holiness. And only if something is endowed with holiness, you, you ascribe sanctity to something that other than God uh, is there this concern of a vodazara. But just merely... Um, being Rishayim, who have a flag to symbolize their endeavor, um, that's not, that doesn't raise any possibility of a desire. Everyone knows, they just, they wanted to have a Siman, a mere symbol. Just like any other, okay, any other neutral, secular object, okay, without any sense of sanctity whatsoever, despite all the ways in which we act reverently towards the flag, as Carly said. Also the American flag. Okay, that's also there in the synagogue. It also proves. No one thinks it's a holy object. Okay, the flags are there so that the leadership of the shul can demonstrate and to show that they love America and they love Israel. That's all. They want everyone to know how much they love America. They want everyone to know how much they love Israel. So we'll put these flags in a big public place. Everyone will come and they'll see that and they'll know that about us. That's all. Nobody thinks it's holy. No one's. No one puts. The, no one thinks the flag is there to be worshipped. Okay. 
Okay, so even though, okay, granted, it, certainly it's not like appropriate to bring a flag into the shul in a holy, sacred place like a shul. Certainly not to leave it there in a permanent way. And certainly not to put it next to the own Kodesh. Okay, that's definitely like not right. Don't do that. But to say it's like a real Isur, I don't know. Like, like that's a that's a high standard of evidence to declare something forbidden. Um, I just can't see that, he says. Um, Rather, it's, have, it's, 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 yes. I have a quick question. Yes, um, in Rob Moshe's time, were they saying like prayers for the state of Israel, prayers for the US government in his context? Um, in the, so those prayers definitely existed. Um, right. I'm just wondering because it feels like if we've already sort of let that into the liturgy and might ease up being able to bring in a flag. S explain how, why would that make it easier versus harder like or how is that can you connect the dots I, I think I get what you're saying but can you like sure it just feels yeah. like if if within your liturgy you've already chosen to say we are going to you know pray pray that we have these things and and pray to God to help us to maintain and keep these things as they are um or better mm -hmm. <laughs> um then it seems like having a symbol of something you're saying within liturgy doesn't feel so off base within a, a sacred space. That's um, interesting. That's interesting. Um, anybody want to respond to Zoe's comment, either to agree or to disagree or push back? I mean, historically, I'll just say, I'll, I'll just say, like historically, I think probably synagogues that had flags were also saying prayers for the governments of Israel and America of one kind or another. Um, the Israel that we say in our shul is and it's in the you know in the um RCA and Koran Cedar. No, that was written by the Israeli rabbinate in I don't know mm -hmm. in the 1950s or before. Um uh, Herzog wrote that to so that certainly predates this Shuva. I don't know which shul said it and when, but uh, probably something was being said in most in most synagogues that would have of this sort that would have put flags in. Prayer for America goes back, you know, also, I mean the prayer for the government goes back uh uh, centuries, you know, and uh, you know it uh, in America as well, and and so I, I imagine, you know, again, that, that's he doesn't, but he doesn't bring that in. So I think there's a, I think to value something and pray for something seems different than like bringing that like an object symbolizing that thing into your sanctuary. That, 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 so I think there's a space for saying we're gonna. I mean, I you know there are plenty of shuls I know which would never put a flag, but they still say some of these prayers. So I'm not, I'm not sure that it has to be a one to one correspondence. Um, I, I guess right. I can also see a universe where they were not saying the prayer for many not Israel for like his shul, but I mean, I, maybe that's going too far. He might, but like, yeah, I, I don't think with Moshe, had, I don't think the shuls where he daven probably said any of those prayers. I would, I, my, my guess, um, but uh, you know, he doesn't address it here. He doesn't raise that issue here. It wasn't part of the question, um, right? So yeah, um, yeah, okay. Um, Okay, good. So thank, thank you for, for raising that point. Okay, so it's heavily it's just a foolishness. Okay. The Im Fshar, the Ofen Shal Shalom, the Salkami Veda Knesset, Hayazed the Bartov, Aval So Machloket Bishfilze Asor. Okay. And if it's possible to, like, in a pleasant way, without Machloket, okay, in a peaceful way, you get removed the flags from the Shul, yeah, go ahead and do it. But to cause a Machloket, to cause divisiveness and division in the congregation over this, that is Asur, okay? So what is prohibited? Not putting the flags in. It can't really, it doesn't like it. It's Hevel Vashtus, but he can't figure out an Isser. What is absolutely a categorical Isser is causing Machloket over something like this. Okay, and if you didn't have like the, you know, you could remove the flag just so we wouldn't be reminded of the, what these Rishayim did, okay? Really, real sort of antagonism towards the, the uh, the fathers of, of Zionism here, um, right? We don't want to re recall the you know they're, they're not good people, okay? He's he's really showing a certain a, a, a explicit antagonism towards Zionism as an ideology, okay? That he sees really as foreign to uh, to Judaism as he understands it, and is saying like we don't want to be reminded of that, right? And and you know it, it should, doesn't belong in our shul. These are not good people. These are not role models. We shouldn't uh, put their flag in our shul. But this is not should be a cause of machloket. Therefore, the people who want the breakaway minion, okay? The Chashvim Shosim Bazed Devar Gadol, they think they're doing a great thing. If they're, you know, the Frim ones who are going to have their breakaway minion, you know, they're not going to be part of this Balabat Shul with those stupid flags. 
Okay, and we're gonna think so highly of ourselves by making a breakaway minion. Um, they're not acting appropriately. Viraku Indian politics, it's just a political kind of machinations. And where does it come from? Mitzad Koach Yetzer, the Hasatan Hashem of Antin Rabim, Mirakeid Beinan. Okay, it, it comes from like this, their own evil inclination, their pride. Okay, their okay, self importance. Okay, it's Satan dancing among us that causes the break, the firm breakaway minion. Because they think they're gonna, you know, do this wonderful thing. They're just causing dissension and disunity and division in the shul over something that actually isn't um, isn't a prohibition. Okay, and this is we're stuck with. We're stuck. Satan dances among us until God has mercy on us. Okay, until God in His mercy will redeem us and uh, okay, uh, let us walk in the ways of the Torah and the truth. Okay, without deviation left or right. Moshe Feinstein, that he has the tshuva. So, okay. I have a few things to say about this tshuva, uh, but I want to hear, before I say what I want to say, I want to hear your um, your comments. I'm going to stop the share of the screen. You have the link if you want to look at the text, but I want to, you know, if you want to talk, I want to see your faces. Um, okay. Reactions? How would you characterize this? Okay. I'm surprised he draws such a sharp line between... Um like usser versus um any other value you know like there's a whole continuum of um public policy or indians or whatever might have you that fall below the line of usser but still might be not preferable that he acknowledges but to say that we value like communal unity over all those things is i don't know offhand but i feel counter to things he might say elsewhere and certainly things that many of our communal leaders today say so it's pretty uh-huh. surprising Interesting, right? In other words, it seems like very, uh, just tell me if it's, if it's not us or then it's fine. If it's not us or then stay out of it. And here he's, well, he's not, he's not saying, he's saying, he doesn't like it. He says, it's, but if you lose them, that would be great. What? This like avoiding machlokas is more important. Yes. Correct. That's that's what? really, yeah, extreme, I think, relative, right. relative to how people actually behave. Uh-huh. Like, right, right. This doesn't sound so familiar to you. Like, where, where, where like, if, if you wrote, Moshe, Moshe, Moshe Feinstein wrote this in 1957, like what explains the last, uh, you know, it's like seventy years, okay, of uh, of our of our lives. If, uh, if, the, if the highest value seems to be avoiding machloket, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think, in general, with Moshe Feinstein, you had a tactic. This was explained to me once. You know, like you comparing him to, let's say, the Chassam Sofer. Chassam Sofer felt in his, you know, battles against, you know, reforms in Judaism in the in the European context, the Hungarian context, that you want to, you, you you know, defend every last minhag, and you know, fight really, really hard about. This is the smallest, you know, innovation so that you never have to concede anything really important, right? Like bring the fight to the enemy, you know, have your front lines as far out as possible from your real um, interests and, 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 you know, core, you know, interests so that if you concede a little bit, if you have some defeats, you're still front line still far away. And much of fights, and I think it was characterized by maybe a different tactic of um, like pullback, you know, towards, towards the real assets that you want to protect and be much more flexible where there's no ESOR um, at stake. Barry, yeah. Go ahead, Barry. It's hard to find you. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, does it make any difference that the United States Constitution and the government are proponents of religious freedom, that um, uh, that there's supposed to be some sort of uh, not just democratic, not not really democratic, but republican form of 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 expression and and the uh, and operation of of society and government, and then combine that with our if we're outside the land of Israel, are we not supposed to be respectful of the land and uh, the laws of the land in which we're in? And so, does the United States flag really represent, as opposed to other nations or other nations not like us, who? have these kind of representations. Is this a respect for all of us that we are, if we're not in Eretz Yisrael, at least we're in a land that is proponents of religious freedom and here we are and it's a respect, not a holiness. Yeah. So 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 clearly he doesn't think so because he didn't mention any of that, right? So right? Yeah, that's why I'm mentioning it. <laughs> okay. So to you, that seems to make a difference. You want to say that, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not, you, 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 you want to, you want to march your flag into the shul. Because you think um, you, you said some of the things that you suggest that the country is really special, and the way to show that is by putting the flag in the shul. He didn't say that here. 
Um, elsewhere in his writings, he has nice things to say about America. He has very positive things to say about America, other places. Uh, he doesn't say any of that here because I don't think he sees it as relevant to the question at hand. Um, okay. Right? But, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's it off my chest. <laughs> any, other, any other comments? Um, so I guess I have three, three sort of observations. Um, and I, again, welcome your comments and questions and pushback. First, you know, I have a colleague um, uh, who, who um, characterizes Truva as displaying the dynamic of, uh, you know, a faint right and turn left, okay? So the whole first half, he's like uh, sort of loading the kind of, uh, either very, kind of more from language, you know, it's just, and it's, you know, it's, uh, you know, the Rishayim, we don't want to like, the, we, let's get their, their memory out of our show. And then at the end, you kind of like, after he kind of fades to the right, like, whoo, like turns and says, no, no, keep the show together. Uh, you know, uh, uh, like my cloak is, is the worst thing. So it sort of like kind of gets you, you know, sort of unexpectedly. So as a kind of uh, to appreciate the rhetoric here, the, sort of how he's uh, unfolding the argument, I think that's sort of like this, that that's how this chuva has been, uh, has been characterized. So I sort of offer that to you, if that's like a helpful way to kind of appreciate like, his rhetoric, at least, or sort of the argumental style that he's doing and to understand what's going on. Um, when I've read this in the past, I've really understood this and sort of the historical context that's made the most sense to me has been seeing this as like the context of a really like sort of strengthening um, kind of an orthodox denominational identity um, in the context of the 1950s where Moshe finds that this, you know, during these years, he's really drawing a very hard line against the non-orthodox denominations and any kind of participation in their ritual life and any kind of, uh, and their, their rabbis shouldn't be, you know, um, relied upon for anything, you know, in a very, very kind of uh, extreme, like, uh, extreme, you know, uh, strong uh, a way. Uh, and I think the, right, and that, that characterized his, you know, you know, his writing and his activism and his leadership, you know, through the 50s and 60s, you know, to the end of his life. Uh, you know, you, a wedding officiated by non-Orthodox non -Orthodox rabbi, you know, doesn't create a marriage, right? There's no need for forget, right? For example, it's like the most, uh, probably the most uh, kind of um, dramatic, you know, uh, kind of position, halakhic position that he promulgated, okay? Um, and and uh, others of that ilk, that that, um, that sort. And I think the like, the flip side is is the need to kind of protect a shul that is orthodox, even if it isn't so from, okay, right? If you're going to, I just imagining kind of 1957, most orthodox Jews were not observant in 1957, right? Most people who went to an orthodox shul in the 50s and 60s were not Shomer Shabbos. Um, that's and and what I mean, so I'm imagining this shul with the flags and the break and the break and the breakaway men here, okay? As a shul where you know, this is before there were date Jewish day school, this is before, right? This is when most you have to work on Shabbos, you know, for, in, for most many people still. Um, and, and so, so this is not an observant Orthodox congregation, these are people who nonetheless, though, are still going to an Orthodox shul. Um, and so I think what's happening here is like the flip side of his, like, you know, if you're going to heighten this, the significance of denominational identity and say that a conservative rabbi who is personally observant is nonetheless completely invalid to make brachas and to be a witness and to officiate a marriage just because he's a ordained conservative rabbi and has that, maintains that affiliation. The flip side of that is that you got to um, show some love for your local Orthodox shul. Okay, even if it's filled with Michale Shabbos, even if they put flat, even if it's a Balabatish, you know, kind of, you know, mid-century, um, I'm sure. Um, like, you got, you got to keep that big tent together. Um, so that's like, a, that, that's that's the context in which I've like kind of seen this chuva. I think there's some others like that as well, right? Don't make the breakaway minion, okay? Like, let's let's shore up this identity of like people going to an Orthodox shul because that's becomes, for Rosh Hashanah, it's really, really important in the 50s. In the 50s, Orthodoxy was very much on the decline, very much, um, you know, its future did not look right um, in 1957. Uh, and, and so he, yeah, he's like really reinforcing that orthodox affiliation. The shul, right? he, he opens by saying the shul was built kedin with all the, with Kedusha Beta Knesset, right? He's saying there's a mechitza, okay? Like they're, they, they use an orthodox sidor, okay? It's, it's, a, it's functioning as an orthodox shul. Like let's, let's keep this shul together. Don't, don't think that, you know, uh, you're doing something good by forming your from breakaway minion uh, where, where you're not going to have your flag. And presumably it's a, you know, everyone is Shomer Shabbos or more likely Shomer Shabbos at that shul. Okay? I have a question. Yeah. This is just because I had been thinking about about this recently. Uh, so Moshe finds uh, the Rav Feinstein, he's known partly for having a more lenient position on Mechitza, on what exactly is needed for Mechitza. Is that, do you think, related to um, to the whole project? 
he was had a lenient position about a lot of things, but he, I, you know, I, but he was. You could just so, think it, right? I mean, I don't know. So he was, yeah, it may be. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. You know, okay. the, you know, he was. The, I, I don't know. I think he. I think the tactic of just like you know, really, he wanted to make it easy for people to do to be Jewish. So he 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 had a lot of like really really significant leniencies that were really you know transformed the world and and. Uh, um, but he also was really hard line about and, and very, you know, emphatic about some things. I think that the strategy that I, I, I think most characters, as I said before, just like really, you know, you pull back your forces to defend your core assets and, and you, you, you can see the things that are less important. I think that, that, that to me is sort of how, um, I, I understand what he's doing. So let's, 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 um, say something more about nationalism though. Okay. So it's so, you know, cause, um, I think maybe. You, you can sort of see here, um, like a because one, one of you said one of you said this. Um, maybe you can see in this shuva sort of he's presenting like an alternative sphere of kind of like the same emotions and the same values that can animate nationalism. Okay, in the sense that I forget who, one of you said this, right? Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, I don't remember who said it. Doesn't matter. So, uh, so um, in in the place of um, in the in the place of like the nation as as the focus of our collective identity. Okay, instead of pouring our um, individual, um, kind, you know, subduing our individual aspirations for the greater good of the nation, and we're going to. You know, uphold the nation as the you know, its values, its its transcendence, its endurance. Okay, will live beyond us, and it's right. I mean, that's you know, flags. You know, it's, it's sort of like a, it's a, you know, they're, they're, they function that way. Like they're, they're totems or they're phallic symbols or they're, they're they're ways to make us feel secure when 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 things are frightening, right? So and 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 we subdue our our individuality and we subdue our right to dissent for the sake of of that nas of the national project. Um, so. Rav Moshe is, is kind of channeling some of those in, those, those those feelings uh, into the shul itself, um, right? Where you know, like, what, what what's the value that 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 merges like like primary? Okay, in this in this uh, um, hierarchy of values, it, it's like avoiding machloket. What kind of machloket are we avoiding within the shul? Okay, so instead of you know. Uh, we, we we can't tolerate this dissent because it'll undermine national unity. It's no, we can't tolerate dissent because it'll undermine the unity of the shul. The shul then therefore becomes a kind of microcosm for for um, for the nation, or it's like in place of the nation, or it's it's the that's the sphere where we come together at, and overcome our differences and build some sort of collective life that transcends us and 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 lives beyond us and can accomplish things we can't accomplish together and where it's worthy to like kind of subdue our own like individual like you know desire for self-expression for the sake of that greater good and we're gonna and stifling machloket is gonna be like almost the top um priority okay not for the nation but for the shul um and so i think he sort of what maybe emerges is 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 a shul as an alternative to 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 having sort of national identity okay um maybe a bit of a stretch but i kind of want to offer that as as um as something that emerges, right? Because you know, uh, no flag, no rally around the flag. Instead, but we're going to rally around the shul, okay? And, and uh, let, let's avoid machlok within the shul context, okay? Um, questions, comments on on that? Um, do you buy it, anyone? Doesn't this kind of conflict with what a hard line he did take on machitza or other options within the shul, where? I'm not familiar with his position on Mechitza in depth, but like I, I think he was part of the wave of people who said, if you don't have Mechitza, you're a conservative synagogue. It's not Mater Daven there. I know he says you can't get married in a conservative synagogue, which goes back to what you were saying. Um, but he did see the synagogue as this battleground. So Yeah, yeah. So I guess like everybody, I, I, I think like everyone wants, uh, you know, so one way you could say like there are limits, right? So so let's 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 have unity. Let's let's stifle dissent, but but there are limits to that, and those limits seem to him to be like, is there an isur? Okay, if I can identify an isur, thing hmm? to move to that battleground though, right? Machitza is like not obviously an isur. He thought it was. He thought it was. For him, it was right. I understand. Machitza, right? Nobody wrote machitza for a thousand years, and then in 1954, it becomes uh, you know the dividing line between orthodoxy and non-orthodoxy in North America. So that that's that's a. You're right. It's, it's sort of curious that, that that that's how history. But for him, he I, I think he was sincere in his belief that this was an absolutely necessary component. Uh, you know, he writes 
he writes about um, the bima being in the middle of the shul, and he says, you know, in Hungary that was really important, in America it's not so important. So, um, uh, like that, that wasn't the issue in Hungary. That was a dividing line: orthodox and a non-orthodox shul. If the bima was in front, it was a non-orthodox shul. And he says, in America, yeah, just as long as it's like a little bit of space, it's that's enough, okay? Because that was like in Hungary that was really important. In America, that's not the issue. So, I, I look even people who have who have strong senses of let's like go back to the nation. People who have strong senses of like the value of national unity and patriotism and nationalistic fervor. They also hopefully have red lines. Okay, right? You know, it's not, you know, it, it's uh, where, you know, I, well, I'll, I'll, yeah, like national unity is important and patriotism. Okay, we'll sing the anthem and pledge allegiance, but there's a, there's a red line or a black line I'm not going to cross. You know, even if the, you know, even if orders to do so, or even for the sake of, you know, the greatness of, of, our, of our country. So, so here too. So Jewish unity is important to him. And, you know, and the shul should be, of, you know, it's a void machloket in shul. Like that's the sphere in which Satan dances among us. And that's our Yetzirah, you know, that's sort of, you know, that, that's causing all this splintering of, of, of synagogue life. But um, we still have to have principles and we can't, you know, we can't be, uh, you know, we have to have red lines. Um, yeah. At, yeah, Adam? Yeah, you know, historically, Jews have had to dance with this line forever. Like in Eastern European, 1600s, 1700s, Europe, Jews made like, you know, vertical, uh, integrations with, you know, those in power, mm -hmm. you know, in Russia, and then at other times they had to make like horizontal integrations, I remember learning. So the people that felt that they were oppressed by, you know, an oppressive government or regime, they wouldn't kill the Jews, but then the Jews, you know, the Jews had to play it both ways amongst common folk when there was revolts. And then they also had to play it well with the people in power and make allegiances with them to be protected too. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so I'm, it's interesting that he's addressing this and I feel it's, you know, you know, like imagine if, you know, there's a synagogue today that had, you know, the Russian flag in it or something like that. How would we feel, you know, as Jews right now, but if they feel they need to have that to be protected and to stay open, you know, you want to talk about lines, you know, and you're in a country like yeah, Russia yeah, totally, you have totally. or, pickle or whatever it is that Putin wants you. And then you could do whatever you want with your Torah. Correct, um, correct, correct. You know, so yeah. I'm not I making a, a, a judgment. I'm just saying how this is much deeper than I think, like the ramifications are much larger than I think we really got into so far. I see. I mean, in other words, like like the, the, the actual issue itself of like showing that you love your country is not just about how we actually feel about our country. It's also about demonstrating that we love our country for the sake of our safety. And there's that, that it doesn't address that here. And, yeah, think, and for, for, and for you to be able to practice halacha in mitzvot. Yeah, right, right, correct. That, that's a good point. It's that. a very good point. Um, I think there's, there's one, there was one Haredi rabbi, I forget who, who's made some like, uh, you know, you know, sort of his positive evaluation of Zionism, you know, is rooted in the like, the support of this Medina Israel for like all the Torah learning, you know? So it's like a backhanded way of like, I'm not a Zionist, but I, have to acknowledge that the state of Israel is like the greatest father-in-law in Jewish history and the number of like Torah scholars that they're, that it's scholarship, it's funding, okay, you know, so, okay, so that, that's, that's one piece of it. And, and yet for safety and for, for sure, you know, he, he writes, you know, in terms of his feelings in America, there's a letter he, he wrote, which, um, he, it's in English, so he probably dictated it or somebody wrote it, you know, on his behalf or in his consultation, but he, in, in, shortly before he died, 1980, maybe in 84, in 1980, uh, encouraging Jews to vote. Okay, and he um, every election year, people sh it gets shared a lot on like social media platforms. The letter from Moshe Feinstein telling people J Jews to vote, and he says an obligation to vote. And he says, you know, when we came to America, we found safety and we found refuge. And, you know, and he and he lived in Soviet Russia. He knew precisely what he found when he came here, uh, and therefore he says it's an obligation to vote out of a feeling of hakaratato, which is a prime. You know, he said it's a prime Jewish value. We show gratitude to those who are good for us. And out of Hakaratov, we have to vote, which I think is super interesting. Um, this was a, you know, it's super, super interesting because he's saying he's not saying vote to protect ourselves. He's not saying vote to maximize our self-interest and to get as much government funding for our communities and to advance our interests. He's saying, no, like vote, like you have to vote for the best interest of the country because otherwise it's not Hakaratov, right? You have to, if you want, you're voting to be grateful to America and that only works if you're voting in what you think is the best interest of the country, which might be different from what's in your own personal best interest. It's a real kind of like Republican uh, theory of uh, kind of like democratic citizenship of like what, what does Republican citizenship, you know, entail? It means, you know, you're, you're, you're participating in civic life 
for the greater good, not for your own self-interest. Uh, and, and he sort of says that's a religious obligation for Jews because we receive this, this refuge here. Um, so I, th I think it's a very profound, like political philosoph philosophical statement uh, in this little letter, short letter of Russia Feinstein. So we have things to say. I think, um, you know, sort of nonetheless, like the flag doesn't belong in shul, right? Because uh, there's something of like really, you know, like we, nations come and go, Jews live in all sorts of places and, and like the values that we're kind of inculcating really trans in shul, when we dive in, really transcend that. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a, because when religion gets kind of hitched to promote, we'll see this next week. This is Leibovitz's big, uh, you know, kind of insight, which I guess you could segue to next week. When religion is kind of hitched to supporting, um, harnessed to supporting a national agenda, that often goes, Leibovitz thought, always goes in very, very dark places. Um, when kind of the religious feelings and, and ideas of sanctity and, and, and uh, transcendence gets mixed in with like national goals of collective life, uh, for Leibovitz, that, that's a very short line to fascism and, and a very, very quick and dark, dark, dark path. Um, okay. Other comment, Marilyn, yes. Uh, do other countries uh, uh, have flags and shoals? That's, no, that's a great Canada, question. Canada. Yeah. Uh, that's Australia. A <laughs> That's a great question, and I don't know the answer. I do know they say prayers for the monarch in Canada and in the United Kingdom. I don't know if they have flags in their shuls. I have not been in enough shuls to, to, to really comment. Uh, do shuls in Israel have the Israeli flag inside the shul next to the... I don't remember. That's weird. Certainly outside the shul. If not, I don't know about inside. Um, yeah, from Soloveitchik, not very positive with Israel. You know, he has a letter. He talks. He says, you know, the flat. You know, anything. It's it's sanctified by the blood of the Chayalim who gave their lives for the Jewish people. He writes very, like, effusively about uh, the flag of Israel. You know, so so he he thought saw it. You know, he was captivated by that kind of the poetry of of the of the flag. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, you see sometimes you see these these. Uh, you know, Jews and repressive regimes. Can think about Adam's comment writing about their government. You know, like if, you remember when. Maybe 25 years ago, there were a group of Iranian Jews who were taken prisoner by the government, accused of being spies. And I, I think eventually they were released. Or they, I, I don't, there was a whole, uh, do you remember, I don't know if that sounds familiar, that episode. It was one, whatever, there's a lot of episodes in the recent history of the Iranian Jewish community. The leadership of the community wrote a letter, a public letter about how happy they were living in Iran, how they felt how the Islamic Republic was so great to them and respected the freedom of religion and how great their life was and how patriotic they were, how much they loved their government. You know, so it was like, it broke your heart to read that letter because, you know, you, you one suspects it's not, it was not a sincerely written letter, you know, um, you know, it's, it's uh, so, yeah, you know, sort of, you know, but if we have a long history of kind of having to make those statements, having to live, uh, you know, and uh, look, it's, it's um, this week's part, you know, and Yosef is, uh, you know, patriotic Egyptian who does great things for Pharaoh and uh, it turned out poorly, right? That was not, so, okay. Any final comments or questions before we, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I guess I just feel like here, the whole flag thing is really relegated as like a stylistic choice one way or the other. Like it doesn't feel all that significant, just like with machitza or with anything else. It's sort of like, are we going to call this a halachic thing or a stylistic thing? Mm -hmm. And it feels like he ends up at stylistic. So he's like, this is not worth like making a fuss about. Yeah. Um, so it's, it feels to me like, you know, you're coming with all these things from Europe and you have to decide like what's mm. actually important and what's really just like the European field. Yeah. Um, and it feels like this fell on the other side. So do you want to make an argument? So give the, what would the argument be if you wanted to say like, maybe, you know, we leave aside the Nechitza isn't an important argument. We can bracket that. But uh, let's say if you were to feel like one way or the other, yeah, in or out, like flags are, are is, is really important. What, what, would, what would you say? If, if I were to say flags are really important. Yeah. Like, how do you, like, articulate, can you flesh that a little bit? Um, sure. I'd say that it, you know, just adds a little more unity. It's more Hakarata Tov. It's, it's a lot of good feelings toward like a country that's being good to us right now. And why shouldn't we, you know, be thankful to Hashem for that? All of that can be tied in as like a positive attitude toward the flags. 
Yeah. Like it reminds us, it reminds us where we are and, and, and that our, our ability to gather safely and pray as Jews in large numbers in the beautiful synagogue is because of the safety before by this government and this flag represents that. So, and we could also see that as like, you know, from Hashem, like these, this is all like good things happening to us. Um, and all of that can like, I think be fine in a whole mm-hmm. setting. Yeah, I, th- I, I think I agree that it can all be fine in this whole setting, but it doesn't, necess- doesn't necessitate the flag. I don't know. Um, yeah, also the... the uh, well, the flag also, doesn't have to be strictly necessary to like right, right correct yes yeah, agreed agreed right that's also true right it's also the eagle on top that also gets that gets me a little bit more than the that's the other <laughs> uh, any other questions or um does location of the flag matter audrey asked that's a good uh uh question so he thinks to say he says he says it's best not to bring it in it's certainly not in permanent way and and certainly not, you know, in, in in next to the Iron Kodesh, which suggests that he would not be bothered if it was in a lobby, which is not a sacred place. Just like a, I think the lobby, I think doesn't have the sanctity of a synagogue, so that wouldn't be a problem. Now outside the building, I don't think it'd have a problem. Um, and it's really like in the sanctuaries where the problem is, especially next to the Iron Kodesh, seems to be, you know, because that's like associated, it's like next to the Torah, it's like associated with the Torah. We're facing it when we pray, and that that sort of is, seems like more, you know, more more more, more problematic. Yeah. I I want to I want to jump in and I'll say uh, firstly I'll go on the record and say uh, I'd be happy if we got rid of the flags at the show we don't need them uh, but again not going to make a thing about it Thank so you, uh, <laughs> yes because uh, it's not worth it and so like I, I have other things I care about more um, so uh, the other thing is I'll just bring up because this uh, talking about like Iranians and other regimes I was uh, I always thought so growing up in our Nice little neighbor in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh. There was a Lebanese, there's a, it still is a Lebanese restaurant. And there always was a giant, I don't know who it was always, but from my memory, there's a giant um, American flag in the window. Mm-hmm. And I always walk by and think, do they really want to have the American flag? Or is it because they're Arabs and are scared that people will like, no, no, don't worry. We're like one of you. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I don't know. That's the, what some of that reminded me of. So it's, uh, Especially when Jews were uh, now, I think we could safely remove it and no one would think anything. But especially at a certain point, like, you know, in the 50s and like, are you on our team or are you the communists? You know, there's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's like, right. It's like, you're really secure. You, right. you wouldn't need to put the flag there because it would be obvious that you belong and uh, no one can question that. And it's yeah. the flag. You, you're showing your, your belonging, but actually the fact that you have to show you how much you belong diminishes from the degree to which you belong something like that yeah yeah that's more i guess with the american flag but potentially a similar thing so yeah yeah interesting yeah. just just yeah. one more thought Please. on that just that yeah. i feel like also all school gyms like on gathering places all have american flags so it kind of be like noticeable not to have one i think it's also mm-hmm. part of it it's not just having one it's also like not having one making a statement interesting interesting yeah maybe uh, right, but if houses of worship, I don't know. I, like, do Christians have flags in their sanctuaries now? Like in 2023, is that a thing? I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Audrey. Yeah, you could leave it. Yeah, leave in lobby. Uh, I see, leave in lobby. You could. You could. You could leave in lobby. Shows everyone that we're good Americans, but it keeps it out of the show. That would that could work. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's true. That, that would that would have been a compromise that might have met that that. Uh, I don't know. People were people were. Yeah, I guess here's one other last. You know. You see, to sort of bring a few disparate threads together, um, if not even if, if not if marginal ones, but in terms of Moshe Feinstein and his leniency and his agenda and his you know very famous truva of his is um, you know he permitted um, milk that wasn't certified Chal of Israel in the United States and and uh, some of based on some prior precedent that permitted that, but also he um, uh, says well in the United States um, milk is is under FDA supervision. And so because the government is watching the milk, it's as though it's Chal of Yisrael, he says, because like it is supervised, like like we're all watching, you know, the government's watching and no one would dare um, adulterate the milk because, you know, the government is inspecting it. And there's such a, around the same time, there's such a like, it also to me seems very like, kind of like Eisenhower, <laughs> like administration, like just this like faith in big institutions, faith in the government. If the government says you can't do it, no one would do it, right? Like. Like, there's a government agency inspecting it. Like, obviously the milk is pure and therefore we can drink it. Like such, it seems so, like to me, like now, like the post Watergate, post Iraq war, post everything, you know, it just seems like so naive or so like, you know, I look so cynical, we're so, so cynical. You look at, um, 
you, you look at um, you know rates of trust in government, trust in big institutions, they like collapsed in the years since he you know permitted uh, regular milk. They, so that again, it's just that in terms of like his own appreciation for America and the general appreciation for America in his time, it was very very strong. So and nonetheless, he didn't like the flag central. Susan wrote, is the issue not only the flag as a symbol that its physicality may bring it closer to zero. You mentioned the eagle made me wonder. Yeah, that's interesting, right? Because it's. I, I think so. I think so, right? I mean, he says it's, he says there's no about Azara because nobody thinks it's Kadosh. But the fact that he says nobody thinks it's about Azara suggests that the implication of the questioner is that maybe there's a hint of about Azara. And I do think, right, the fact that it's not like an object, again, in the front of the shul next to the Torah, um, it, it, you know, it, it is a certain, right, it's a, it's a physical physical incarnation, if you will, of, of this value, as opposed to saying prayers for America, you know, which, right, which, uh, you know, like, I, you know, it's interesting. Well, was the prayer for America, the only prayer we say in English. I just always feel it's like we want everyone to hear. You know, anyone who walks into school, they should know that we're praying for America, right? Um, but uh, we say it in Hebrew, like my school. So, how shall we say it? How shall we say it? Uh, <laughs> how shall we say it in English? Uh, which I feel is a little bit demonstrative. The eagles are usually for Roman government. Yeah. And also, you know, the story when the when the Romans brought the eagle into, they were like, you know, big riots when the Romans brought an eagle into the day of Igdash. Um, oh, I didn't know that. So we definitely yeah, shouldn't have an eagle, it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, we take the, uh, the eagle. We can cover the eagle off. It's yeah. interesting with the flag and the shul, he thinks the original intentionality, which they were made, is, that is, yes. That, that's like maybe a Masechid of Odizara kind of a thing that like the intentionality of the maker seems to have a lot to determine the uh, the status of the object, like even a human form, a three-dimensional, like we have, uh, like, you know, we say, well, we can't make a human, you know, like a, a human form, a three-dimensional human form that's not made for Odizara is actually permissible like we have it like dolls or like lego toys right you know so how, how is it permissible to have a human for three-dimensional human form like because it's it was made to be a toy not to be a right, worship right so yeah that does the, the kavana is very important um all right cool all right we'll wrap up next week wave of it's okay was he right and uh, you know, okay how was he right how was he not or you know you can decide um and then with a little break and we'll come back with uh, Ravamia. thank you thank you so much i uh, really appreciate your listening and your contributions and, and thank you okay